So, Surab, you have founded investment firms in both the UK, which was Clear Capital, and India, Marcellus. Can you tell us uh, these founding stories? You know, it must have been such a different experience both in the UK and, and India. Can you help us just sort of paint the picture? Sure. So, look, the UK startup story, Clear Capital, was 2003, um, and we started the firm. A few of my friends and I got together. Uh, one, of, one of us, Nick Paulson Ellis, had advertised in a UK newspaper called Financial News. I was a management consultant at that time. I was 27 years old, trying to figure out how to how to work in the stock market. And uh, you know, starting out in London, 2003, middle of the, the downturn, the post 9/11 downturn, it was a fairly sedate start. And over the next four years, Clear Capital became a, a very successful investment advice, advisory firm in the UK. But you know, in a country growing at two to three percent, there's only so much excitement you can get. So, so we used to have a nice time at one level. Our offices were next to the River Thames. So at lunchtime, we could go to the Oval and watch, watch a, a test match if there was one going on. Um, uh, Work-life balance was a thing which existed for me back then in 2003, 4, 5. Uh, we made a name for ourselves. Five years later, we sold the firm for a modest valuation to a larger bank in the UK. And that's when I migrated to India. Uh, I worked in India for 10 years for a, for larger, for a larger investment bank. I, built their uh, brokerage business and their wealth management and their asset management business. 2018 is when we set up uh, set up Marcellus. And interestingly, it was much the same core team. The same core team that had worked in Clear Capital was also setting up Marcellus in 2018. Now, this startup story was very different. Yeah, I was 40 years old. I had a little bit of money. Um, but, but our aspiration was get to was to get to $100 million of asset ma- assets under management, have a nice you know, nice work-life balance, go home at 6 o'clock, you know, uh, enjoy, enjoy the evening with the family in the evening. Um, um, but that $100 million aspiration turned into uh, a billion dollars next to no time. I think in three years, less than three years, we hit a billion dollars under, under management, largely local money, some of it American and British endowment money. And uh, from having two staff in 2018, we hit 120 staff by by 2021 and in retrospect i guess that makes sense right this the indian economy is growing at seven percent in in real terms the stock market has compounded by 13 14 percent now for 20 years Um, there's 20 million investors locally in india Uh, that number is growing by two to three million each year so in retrospect you know our our aspiration to uh, run a business with 100 million dollars of assets under management feels a little quaint uh, I think that's the reality of India. It's, it's a sort of bubbling cauldron of uh, emotion and intensity. Uh, so Clear Capital was a nice, sedate, enjoyable startup. Marcellus is a far more intense, high adrenaline affair. Uh, I've lost most of my hair in the last four or five years building this business. <laughs> well, I mean, I've lost most of my hair and I don't have a billion dollars under management. So, <laughs> um, but I'd love to know about your investment philosophy, uh, both today, but... You know, if you if you think back to your early days at Clear Capital, starting out to now, how it's changed over that journey. So I think part of the change is just you know my getting older. So I, most people, most places in the world start by reading you know Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, um, and and if you read legendary investors like that, you're you build a picture of the world that you're looking out for good companies. You want companies with sustainable competitive advantages, but you also build a picture that that valuation is incredibly important to focus on. As I've got older and as I've migrated from the UK to India, I realized that uh, just as important in valuation, perhaps even more important in my valuation is A, the integrity of the management team, right? So, so this is still, whilst this is the fifth largest stock market in the world, India is, it's still a country where uh, accounting and governance is something that you have to work really hard at. You have to work really hard at figuring out is the is the are the people running the company are they uh, are they honest or are they doing naughty things? So the premium on uh, the premium and integrity I place today is far higher than the one I placed 20 years ago. And the second thing I realized was that because of the changes in technology, because of the way the world has changed, uh, the ability of big data of AI now. Uh, of of highly intelligent management teams to keep building deeper and deeper moats around technology, you can have companies, and indeed India has around a dozen of these companies, you can have companies who compound at 20, 25% for 20, 30, 40 years. And naturally, these companies' valuations will will look eye-wateringly high most of the time. And therefore, 
uh, over the last five six years, uh, my, my colleagues and I've had to re we have we've had to rethink much of what we knew about valuation in our days in London. Mm. Now, uh, Saurabh, you've spoken about work-life balance, and on, on top of managing a bill over a billion dollars, you've also written six books. So, <laughs> where you find the time to do that, I'm not sure, but. One of them we thought was most relevant to our audience, and it's one that one of our experts um, that we've had on the show before has referenced, Andrew Brown, um, which is Coffee Can Investing, The Low-Risk Road to Stupendous Wealth. So what can everyday investors like us learn from this coffee can investing approach? So we got the idea from a gentleman who used to work for Capital in Los Angeles. So uh, uh, his name is Rob Kirby. He's, passed away, I think, six or seven years ago. But in 1983 or 84, Rob Kirby wrote this famous paper called Coffee Can Investing. You can Google it. Just Google Rob Kirby and Coffee Can Investing. I think it's a fabulous four-page paper in which Rob explains that when he was managing money in capital in the 60s and 70s, uh, he was managing money for high net worth people in Los Angeles. And this lady came to him and said, Rob, I'm a really happy client. You've done a great job with my money. Uh, I've lost my husband recently and I want to manage, I want you to manage his portfolio as well. And initially Rob was overjoyed that, you know, look, this lady in her time of you know, grief, she's turning to me to manage uh, the money that her deceased husband used to manage. But when Rob opened the husband's portfolio, right, his grief turned into, into, into sort of panic because he realized the deceased husband had outperformed uh, Rob Kirby by, by two is to one, right? And the reason the dead man had outperformed <laughs> Uh, the fund manager for capital was Rob realized what the man would do, the, the, the gentleman who had passed away would do would, he would buy the same stock Rob Kirby bought. But when Rob Kirby sold, that guy didn't sell. He just sat on those stocks. And by just <laughs> sitting forever on a bunch of you know really good companies, because Rob Kirby's buying criteria was pretty good. He was buying good companies. Rob was exiting those companies prematurely, right? So the most fam the most uh, uh, relevant example, I think, to your audience that uh, uh, that he gave was uh, was uh, Xerox. So Rob Kirby bought Xerox in 68, I think. Um, uh, 71, there was a Israel-American war. Uh, oil prices shot up. So Xerox's margins came under pressure because I guess the, 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 the input into, into toners is petrochemicals. So Rob was scared about the consequences of the uh, Israeli-American war for Xerox's margins. And Rob sold Xerox in 71. And then through the 70s, as you know, right, America and the rest of the world photocopied its brains out. And as the world photocopied its brains out, Xerox took off. But Rob didn't benefit because he had prematurely exited Xerox on this macro scare, right? And and that's what that's why Rob sort of came up with the concept that much like Americans in the Wild West would sort of take their family savings, put it in a coffee jar and shove it underneath the pillow. He said that's the best way to invest. So I read this paper in 2013, and I thought it has enormous relevance for India because I, I, I was seeing the same happen in India. I was seeing around a dozen or so Indian companies compounding cash flows at 20, 25% over very long periods of time. And I felt that what Indian families should do is buy these dozen or so companies. Uh, these are clean, well-run, powerful compounding machines and just sit on them, right? It doesn't matter whether COVID happens or the Russia-Ukraine war happens or China blows up or doesn't blow up, sit on a bunch of really high quality companies and, and you can make a really, really large portfolio. You can build a large portfolio for yourself with minimal trading. So in 2018, my colleagues and I wrote this book that you're referencing, Bryce, called Coffee Can Investing, The Low Risk Route to Stupendous Wealth. And in a way, it was the making of us. It was the making of uh, our careers. Uh, the book has been translated into several Indian languages. It is sold, obviously, the original sells online, but the pirated versions are available on every pavement bookshop in India across the land. <laughs> Love that. You know, you know you've made it when your book's getting pirated and, and distributed online. <laughs> so uh, we want to turn to uh, investing in India more generally because our, our audience here at Equity Mates is mm -hmm. primarily Australian, and then we have uh, some listeners in the US and right. the UK. So... Not a big Indian audience, but uh, we hope to grow it. But, um, you know, the, the India investment story and the economic story has been hard to miss um, the past few years. But I'm sure our perception of that story is just filled with misconceptions. So what are some of the most common misconceptions you hear from Western investors when it comes to India? Um, and what how should we be thinking about India? Sure. So, look, when, when I when I 
go to the United States and to the UK uh, to, to pitch to institutional investors, right? The three things which, which perplex me a little bit, they perplex me less now than they did five years ago, but even now I get sometimes thrown, thrown aback. The first is there's this perception that India is a, is a poor country. And so some people call it poor, some people call it underdeveloped. Uh, that's wrong. It's an inc- incredibly, this is an incredibly, this is an incredibly wealthy country. Um, uh, our estimate is household wealth in India is around ten trillion dollars. Now, clearly, that is unevenly distributed, right? It's unevenly distributed. We are one of the least equal societies in the world, but uh, because there are one point five billion people in this country, you have roughly hundred million people operating at close to first world levels of wealth and wealth and income, and that gives this country an enormous impetus, whether it's in consumption or indeed in stock market investing. So if I look at the data, right, last five years, every year, roughly $100 billion of financial assets has come into the Indian financial system from local households, right? And this is households buying life insurance, general insurance, mutual funds, direct stock market investing, and so on. So I think the first piece to realize is this is a country with a very high savings rate, and it's had a high savings rate for nearly 20, 25 years. So the pot of wealth in this country is very large. And I think for Australian audiences who watch the IPL, I think it won't be hard for them to understand this, right? Because you can see the world's <laughs> highest paid cricket is play in India. And one of the reasons for that is the people watching the IPL are, 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 uh, are people with spending power, which is why the advertising revenues coming from the IPL are so big. So that's the first point to sort of clock that this is actually quite a wealthy country. Um, in fact, if you look at the Indian stock market, other than the United States, other than the American market, no other market in the world has made so much money in the last uh, 10 years the indian stock market has grown by two trillion dollars it was a uh, worth a trillion trillion and a half a decade ago it's worth three and a half trillion today that's also a measure of just how much wealth has been created in india two trillion dollars of stock market wealth i think the second misconception is that somehow this is a wild west this is a you know ropey uh, ropey country with dodgy courts and dodgy lo- rules and regs and i'm not claiming it's a perfect setup uh, I don't think any democracy, any free market democracy can claim to be perfect. That's the, that's the sort of nature of free market democracies. You will have your ups and downs. But by and large, the local legal and regulatory system works. Uh, I've played a, I played my little role in, in sitting in several uh, regulatory committees. But by and large, compared to, say, markets like China or indeed the United States, um, this is actually a fairly uh, robust regulatory uh, system with courts which are by and large fair. So, so whether it's an institutional investor coming in to invest in the Indian stock market, it's a retail investor in Australia, or an Australian company uh, uh, making investments on the ground in India, you will get a pretty fair shake. You'll get a fair shake from what is a relatively transparent and well-managed regulatory and legal system. And the third piece that I get a little perplexed by is this point of view on valuations, right? This is, if you ask me, this is the biggest bugbear I have with Western investors. Um, A lot of people expect to see a developing nation to have cheap valuations. But if that developing nation has been growing at 7% real for 20 years, and if well-managed companies are growing their cash flows at 25% for 20 years, you're not going to get them at 20, 30 PE, right? You'll have to pay, pay up for that. And, and, and therefore, the, the kind of quaint notion that I'm entering a developing economy, give me developing economy valuations, it doesn't work. Um, and those who have sort of the foreign investors who keep waiting for India to get cheap, I suspect they'll be waiting for many more years for India to get cheap. <laughs> well, I mean, with those misconceptions in mind, how should we be thinking about investing in India? Like you've made it now sound like a pretty tantalizing opportunity. So how should we in the equity mates community start to, to think about uh, investing in India? So, so I think uh, uh, from a practical perspective, I don't think uh, 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 foreign nationals can individually come in. I, I don't think it's easy for foreign nationals to individually come in. What, what foreign nationals can do is invest in India funds so, so there's a whole host of global fund management houses, the Fidelities and Capitals, who will have India funds, I'm sure. Uh, there's a bunch of American ETFs as well. So, for example, I think MSCI, uh, not, not MSCI, sorry, BlackRock. BlackRock runs the largest Indian ETF. It's called, uh, it's called I, the, the Rai Shares line of products has a India ETF available, which is the largest ETF coming into India. Um, but but the, other, the, the other thing that the Indian government has made relatively easy is it's allowed pension funds or uh, mutual funds or indeed even foreign corporates 
to come and invest in the Indian market. Uh, that whole process of a, of a foreign corporate or a foreign fund or a foreign endowment or family office based in Sydney, coming and investing in the Indian market has been made quite straightforward. You basically register with your custodian. Your custodian could be Citigroup or Bank of New York Mellon or Deutsche Bank. You choose your custodian. The custodian sets you up to invest in India. And that's the legal fees done and dusted. Now, in terms of stock selection, um, uh, I could recommend my books. Uh, if you want to sort of get a primer on how to select stocks in India, Diamonds in the Dust is the Diamonds in the Dust is the book my colleagues and I've written. That too has been pirated widely, um, and it's been trans <laughs> translated into various Indian languages. The first, the first, uh, uh, first part of Diamonds in the Dust focuses on accounting fraud and how you can detect which Indian companies are cooking their books. That's roughly 40% of Indian companies uh, you eliminate through the forensic Whoa. accounting route. And then the second the second chapter is on, second piece of the book is on a capital allocation. Because this is a country with high growth, you need to look for rational capital allocators, companies who can deliver a return on capital consistently of 15% or better. And the final piece is dominant franchises, right? Much like America between 1880 to 1930, we're going through a bit of a gold rush or land rush ourselves. So smart companies who are conquering ent entire industries are doing so quietly. You don't want to go on sort of, you know, TV or CNBC and shout out from the rooftops that you're grabbing the commanding heights of the Indian economy. So you, so you and I have to do a little bit of work to figure out who are these companies who are grabbing strategic chunks of the economy using technology, using smart business processes. And if you join these three pieces together, forensic accounting, capital allocation analysis and looking at the looking at the franchise looking at the dominance of the franchise in sec, you know, sectors like banking sectors like you know, consumer discretionary spending sectors like pharmaceutical you're able to identify i would say 15 to 20 large compounders companies with market caps around 40 50 billion dollars who can grow your wealth at uh, in say australian dollar term 16 17% pretty consistently love that it's very exciting yeah. When we were uh, emailing before this interview, uh, you, you mentioned uh, that there were some good mm -hmm. books and some good movies uh, to understand India. Obviously, a couple of your books that you've mentioned top that list, but um, uh, are there any other ones that we should be adding to our list to, to go away and, and watch or read? So let me start with the movies piece, because I suspect movies are, are perhaps a more enjoyable way to get plugged into India. <laughs> so sort of, if you want to sort of relatively, you know, um, what should I say, a, a sedate start to learning about India, start with At Attenborough's Gandhi. I think it was made in 1982. Uh, uh, it won lots of Oscars in 1982. And it's about the, uh, the father of, uh, the fa what we, the, it's about Mahatma Gandhi, the man we call the father of the nation. So, so I think uh, this is Richard Attenborough. Uh, uh, Richard Attenborough is the British director and, and Gandhi is a kind of seminal movie which explains the foundation of India. Then if you want to pick up the pace and come to sort of modern day India relatively quickly, uh, there are two movies. It's a, a part one and part two. It's called Gangs of Vasipur. Gangs of Vasipur. Extremely exciting movies on how the mafia functions in India. Right? Uh, uh, this is basically our equivalent to the Godfather 1, Godfather 2. Unfortunately, uh, part three wasn't made, but Gangs of Vasipur, part one and part two. A lot of fun. Anybody who has quaint ideas about, you know, India being the land of uh, mystics and yoga and, and meditation, I think they'll be in for a rude shock when they watch the gangs of Vasipur. This is a full-on full on high intensity uh, growing economy. And, uh, and, and then if you, if you want to sort of develop your knowledge in India using books, uh, I would say read V.S. Naipaul's India, A Million Mutinies Now. V.S. Naipaul's India, A Million Mutinies Now, written in 1989, but I think the best book ever written on the country. It feels like it was written yesterday morning he captures the the aspirations and the kind of sheer spirit and punch of the people really really well vs naipaul india million mutinies now then you can move on to ram goha's ram goha's india after gandhi that's more about the development of the politics and, and how democracy developed in india and uh, for a for a more irreverent for a more irreverent look, look at india read uh, james crabtree james crabtree was the former ft uh, correspondent in india James Crabtree's Billionaire Raj. Uh, that's a more irreverent look at some of the richest and most powerful people in the country. But I think you as Australians, you know, you're the country from where, say, uh, titans like Rupert Murdoch have hailed. I don't think you'd be surprised at any of this. And all of this will give you a pretty, uh, a pretty realistic picture of what's happening in this vast economy. 
Wow. Well, I've just been quickly Googling and opening new tabs as you spoke there. So um, a few movies and a few books to add to the reading list. So looking forward to getting into that. Um, we we want to turn to some of, uh, I guess, some some stories about particular Indian mm-hmm. companies or um, some things that you've um, spoken about in terms of the macro environment and stuff like that. I guess some more um, specific uh, stuff. And we can't go past the Adani story to start things off because I think for a lot of uh, Australian investors, that's probably what they think of first when they think of investing in India in 2023. So... We obviously watched it from the outside, looking in. Uh, t- tell us what it was like in the country at the time and sort of what, what are you seeing now and where to from here for, for Adani? So, look, I think let me start by noting the fact that the Indian Supreme Court has, has opened an investigation into it and the Indian Securities Regulator is due to present to the highest court in the land in the next few days about what their what the securities regulators investigation is yielding um, more often than not i've seen the supreme court deliver and uh, deliver justice so you know i, I remain optimistic that the, the courts will do the right thing here um, uh, but you know if i look at the most obvious aspect of this right and, and i and, and, I'm, and i'm bring this out because i think this is important this the company that you mentioned it wasn't as if indian domestic institutions were loaded up on the stock it was foreign investors intriguingly who were the heaviest investors in this name. And even today, even after everything that's happened in the last six, seven months after Hindenburg and all that, even today it's foreign investors who are loading up on the stock. And I find that extremely interesting, right? What it suggests to me is that the local regime in India is pretty tight and tough, both in terms of disclosure and in the way the Indian securities regulator deals with the market. The fault line, the Achilles heel, I think, of the Indian market and perhaps many other markets is, is uh, these money laundering havens through which money comes into into markets like India. And the reason I'll tell you why it's the fault line. If a market like India, right, we're still not a developed world market. So if India today takes a very hard line stance on money from offshore tax havens coming into India, then the Western media and Western investors turn against India and say, look, these guys are putting up walls against capital inflows. This is not right. This is not WTO. This is not how... Washington consensus should be playing out. So if India takes a hard line and blocks money coming in from offshore tax havens, that doesn't play well with the with the global capitalist audience. And on the other hand, if India keeps its borders sort of open, if India keeps its markets open to coming in from to money coming in from uh, from uh, less than ideal jurisdictions, then then this becomes the this becomes a a fault line for the Indian market. That that com- com- countries with low disclosure regimes basically offer a base through which you can you can come into the Indian market and that gives you room to do lots of uh, uh, lots of very very naughty things now if you read my book diamonds in the dust my colleagues and I have laid out 10 case studies of account, accounting naughtiness in that the first 200 pages have 10 case studies and you'll notice in many of those case studies for example Cox and Kings you'll notice in that case study that the bulk of the naughtiness gets done in offshore tax uh, offshore tax havens and then that ripples into the Indian stock market. I think this is a fault line for the Indian market. I don't have, I don't think there's an easy answer for the regulator. If the regulator clamps down on this, then foreign inflows get jammed, the market's reputation suffers, the regulator keeps these open, then you have room to you have room to do naughtiness in the Indian market. Um, so, so it'll be interesting to see how that, this piece plays out. But uh, on the, the broader issue, uh, you know, Everybody in India is keenly looking forward to see what the Supreme Court has to say on the subject. Mm. Now, we recently read uh, an interview that you did with the Economic Times where you mentioned China's troubles could be a good thing for India. I think the quote was along the lines of, the macro narrative is probably the best that we have ever had. Wow. Bullish. Huge claim. Huge <laughs> claim. So I guess the question is, well, can you actually help us unpack your thinking sure, here? Sure. So look, I mean, I'll, I'll put it, I'll give you the firstly, the superficial way to un- read that comment. Superficial way is we are at the top of our rate hike cycle. Uh, America's hiked by five and a half percent. Indian Central Bank has hiked by two and a half percent. And even though we are at the top of the rate hike cycle, uh, economic growth is running at six and a half percent. The stock market is close to all time highs. Corporate balance sheets are in the healthiest shape. I've seen them. Uh, in the last 20 years, the banking system's balance sheet is in good shape. So when you're close to the top of the rate hike cycle and you're doing doing well on your macro metrics, that's always very, 
very encouraging, right? But there's a there's a sort of deeper deeper point I've been trying to make in India. If I look at India's challenge over the last twenty years, right, it's fundamentally been around China absolutely hammering the Indian manufacturing community, right? It's simply it's historically it's been impossible for Indian manufacturers to deal with Chinese manufacturers. Chinese manufacturers had cost of capital of three four percent because that was the rate at which the the Chinese government owned banks would lend, and uh, much as that, much as I would like to see cost of capital fall in India, I refuse to find it believable that a developing economy like China or India can have cost of capital at three four percent. So the the blow up in the Chinese banking system, the blow up of the Chinese banking system, I think, has rendered that construct unviable. The sort of billions, trillions of dollars of cheap capital that the Chinese banks gave to co- Chinese companies who would then undercut Indian manufacturers, I think is now out of the picture. Right? That's the first thing to consider. A whole generation of Indian manufacturing has been wiped out. I'm seeing that revival in the last three, four years. It's very, very inter- interesting. Companies that were created in 1975 in India almost died by 2015. And in the last four, five years, they're reviving again as the China, as the Chinese, man- Chinese products no longer are price competitive vis-a-vis the Indian products, right? That's quite remarkable for the first time in the last 20 years, Chinese products are no longer price competitive with many of their Indian counterparts. The second challenge India has historically had is our infrastructure was, was weak compared to China. China put a lot of money into infrastructure, lots of highways, lots of super fast trains. Uh, we haven't invested as much. Uh, it now turns out many of China's infrastructure projects seem to be white elephants and the banks that funded them are in trouble. In contrast, in the last uh, decade or so, India has uh, um, almost tripled its highway network, tentupled its airline network, grown broadband connectivity at ATX. So um, our infrastructure isn't perfect. It's not, I would say, it's not a, a, a Japanese or European standards yet, but our infrastructure is materially, tangibly better than it was a decade ago. Trucks are moving at twice as, it's twice the speed that they used to move, it, move at 10 years ago. Working capital cycles are therefore crunching. And our, and our uh, uh, laggard status on infrastructure, I think, has been remediated considerably. The third piece was dumping, right? Uh, 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 even as I look around the room, right, many of the things in my room itself are Chinese made, right, including the, the laptop to which I'm talking to you. Um, historically, because of the way China uh, dealt with the WTO regime, it was very difficult to stop dumping off of, of Chinese technology products of a range of Chinese manufacturers. Uh, in the last three, four years, I think not just India, I think many other countries the United States included, have taken a harder line stance on dumping. And, and therefore, as the incidence of dumping reduces, we are seeing we are seeing uh, uh, local manufactured companies coming to the fore. Uh, for example, I, uh, Apple has decided that a quarter of the iPhone production and iPad production will move to India. I think Apple makes $220 billion of iPhones and pads. A quarter of that moving to India is a big deal. So, so that's what I meant by uh, by the, the fact that events in China and the way China is playing out finally is allowing India, uh, Indian manufacturing specifically, to find its place in the world. Mm. Just some of those stats that you were talking about there, tripling your highway network, uh, 80 times the broadband penetration, uh, four times the flight penetration, or, or whatever the numbers were, it, it must just be fascinating to be living in a country where like development is happening that quickly and um so bryce uh took a gap year in india back in uh what 2011 2010 2010, so a bit more than a decade on from when bryce was there like how much would have changed in a decade like give us a sense of just how quickly things are are changing over there so let's let's take a example of you know airports right every single airport every single airport that i use for my for my travel around India, every single airport is less than twelve years old, right? Um, um, <laughs> so every airport in the country, Br- Bryce wouldn't have been to any of them because he was there. Yeah, so he would have he would have been to the older version, <laughs> right? He would have been to the older version of the airport, okay. <laughs> right? Um, now, and by the way, the re- result of that is because these are all modern airports, their their ability to handle traffic is at a different level to say what I see when I go to America. Going to America is actually really painful now. Because the airline experience, the, tra- the experience of traveling Amer- around America, or indeed the experience of using London Heathrow, is quite sort of shocking or shambolic to many Indians now, compared to what we see in, in airports in India. Right. The second, the second thing which you notice is, um, 
almost nobody in India in the cities uses cash anymore, right? So I hardly ever oh, go yeah. to the ATM. So whether I'm paying the local uh, three wheeler, so, so we travel around in three wheelers for short hops, right? Whether that guy he will not, if I offer him cash, he will think I'm you know something wrong with me. Right, uh, the guy selling coffee on the streets, uh, tea and coffee on the street outside, he will not take cash. We all pay each other using our phones. So we have got something called U- UPI, the Unified Payment Interface. So if Bryce came to India, Bryce uh, will go out with me for a cup of coffee. Bryce will scan using his phone, using the camera on his phone. He'll scan into the scan into the coffee vendor's bank account, uh, say 25, 25 US cents, and that's how money is paid. Right. So so 51% of GDP. Goes uh, is now transacted using uh, UPI, which is phone-to-phone transactions. That that was a major push from the government, uh, wasn't it, to try and get everyone to start actually using digital payments because so many people were using cash that the lost revenue from a tax point of view Absolutely. was so significant that they just didn't they. For, force the currency so that like the minimum note size was so large that the smaller the smaller sort of change became uh, obsolete and forcing people into digital absolutely so i think it's been a it's a it's both it's been carrot and stick uh, so the carrot that the government has held out for for the entire country and and it's taken 12 years to build this platform right uh, to build the platform every indian has had to get a bank account a unique id the bank account and the unique ID have had to be mapped onto 1.5 billion people's phones. And so it's so been a massive infrastructure build out, right? Uh, but alongside that, the carrot that the government held out was, if you guys do this, um, uh, uh, it becomes far easier for you to do tax compliance, right? So when we fill our income taxes in each year now, a lot of it is just auto filling because all our data, so for example, whatever I'm transacting in the stock market, my, my unique ID is being locked into that. So, so the tax man knows even before I filed what I've made in the stock market, what the capital gains on that are. Similarly, every time I buy a cup of coffee, because my phone is locked into my unique ID, uh, uh, the, the government knows that I've bought that cup of coffee, so does my bank, right? So the, the positive side that the, the banking system uh, and the government is saying is, if we can monitor you and track you, we'll give you cre- credit at much lower rates. So the biggest surge in credit in India, the biggest surge in bank lending is unsecured finance to small vendors selling you know, juice and burgers and driving around in three-wheeler rickshaws. So the, un- the small SME owner is getting uh, credit at a rate that he couldn't have dreamt of, uh, Bryce, when he came to India 11 years ago. Um, the, you could argue that there are, there's a cur- curtailment of civil rights because Big Brother is watching you. Every transaction is now inside this whole net of, uh, of, uh, of big data. Uh, but but that's I think you know that, that's the way I guess a country develops right. So our indirect tax system also locks into this. The indirect tax system is also locked into this whole digital web. Uh, the banking system, indirect tax system, um, and and our entire big data interface locks into it. Um, and that's how the this this country has has sort of I would say leapfrogged many other emerging markets by a couple of couple of generations by making a jump from a almost a country with. 14% of GDP um, being cash, cash transactions of 14% of GDP, they've gone to 51% of GDP being cashless transactions. Wow. It's a fascinating story. Yeah. Let's um let's turn to a couple of individual companies because um, on the podcast, we, we speak to experts every week and we've had a few Indian companies mentioned, uh, but it's often the, the larger companies. HDCF Bank has been mentioned a few times. Reliance and you know everything that it's doing um, obviously gets a mention, but I'm so confident that some of the the greatest Indian companies are just names that we've never heard of. So, what are some of the uh, lesser known uh, Indian companies that you think we and the rest of the world will become aware of in the coming years? So let me take sort of two uh, two completely sort of polar opposites in terms of market cap. And I'll a quick disclaimer: I'm invested in these companies through our through Marcellus's products. So are my parents uh, who live in the UK, uh, and so are our 10,000 clients. So, so with that disclaimer, here's two companies that I think are going to be very interesting to watch. So uh, uh, we are uh, already the pharmaceutical capital of the world in that one in, two, um, one in two drugs that are consumed in America, one in two tablets that are consumed in America is made in India. 
but we are not yet the active pharmaceutical ingredient capital of the world. That, that honor still belongs to China. China makes 80% of the world's APIs. India only makes uh, around 10, 15%. But I think that's going to change. I think very quickly you'll see in the next five, six years, a big chunk of API production, active pharmaceutical ingredient production, will shift to India because I think the American companies, for geostrategic reasons, will shift their dependence from China to India. Now, as that happens, uh, uh, Indian API manufacturers will need more ceramic glass reactors. So pharmaceuticals and APIs are made in ceramic glass reactors. And a company called GMM Fodler, GMM Fodler, Fodler is a German name, P-F-A-U-D-L-E-R. GMM Fodler makes 55% of the world's ceramic glass reactors. They make 80% of India's ceramic glass reactors. These are sort of giant coffee mugs in which... Uh, in which pharmaceuticals are boiled and turned into medicines, right? So this is a world leader. This has been a world leader for 110 years. Five years ago, when we first bought the company, it was just the India leader. They were owned by a German company. Uh, so we looked up the financials. We could see that the Indian company was making more money than the German company. So we suggested to the owner he might want to buy the German company. Um, so we made the suggestion in 2019. 2020, COVID came along. And at the height of COVID, the Indian company acquired the German company. And thus, from being a subsidiary of a German world leader, the Indian company itself has become a world leader. And this is quite a big deal. Uh, pharmaceutical glass reactors are critical for the well-being of a pharma plant. Uh, nobody goes and sort of experiments with cheap Chinese glass reactors. You want the best in the world because the, otherwise you'll get shut down. Even a hairline crack in a glass reactor will, sh will shut down your pharma plant. And therefore, I, I expect this company's world dominance to grow, plus the fact that India itself will become the API hub of the world will, I think, reinforce their dominance. So GMM Fodler uh, profits have been compounding at 50% for five years. Um, wow. and don't see any reason for it to stop because it's, it's a essential product. Uh, so that's a, this is a billion dollar market cap company. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's look at a $50 billion market cap company, which I think is basically a tech company, uh, a very smart tech company masquerading as a NBFC. And NBFC means non-bank financial company. Basically, I think you, you might call it shadow lenders in Australia. These are large lenders, but they don't have a buy banking license. So this company is called Bajaj Finance. Uh, my erstwhile neighbor is the CEO. And, and I've watched them for 15 years. What I've realized they do very cleverly is they have built huge repositories of data on 140 million Indians. So we have 1.5 billion strong population, but roughly 140 million Indians account for the bulk of the country's wealth and economic activity. What Bajaj Finance has done is built in enormous uh, amounts of big data on these 140 million Indians, right? You know, what do they do in the morning? Where are they working? How much are they spending? Uh, what socioeconomic strata they belong to? What address they live at? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they've used that to build an extremely profitable lending machine. Uh, the lending machine compounds at 25, 26%. Return on equity is around that same number, right? Even though the company is geared only 5x, right? Most lenders, most places in the world are geared 10x debt equity will be 10x. Bajaj Finance operates at half the gearing and yet has uh, twice the return of equity, twice the return on equity than any other large lender anywhere in the world. Whether you look at JP Morgan's numbers or you come to India and look at, say, uh, State Bank of India's numbers, you'll see Bajaj Finance is inordinately profitable. And the secret is uh, mining big data very expeditiously. Now, to do this, they hire the most number of electrical engineers and computer scientists in India every year. They are the largest Salesforce deployment in the world. This is the only company in the world that Salesforce has a dedicated server dedicated for. Salesforce calls it Mobile. Oh, wow. 140 million Indians, every aspect of their life monitored on that Salesforce server. And this is used to do high velocity lending. So say for dentists, doctors, uh, self-employed professionals, even people like me. If I walk into, say, an Apple store here, even before I told Apple I want a loan on the iPhone, they would, Bajaj's systems would detect that Saurabh has come to the store, that Saurabh is a high quality borrower. And, and uh, by the time I have expressed interest in the phone, uh, uh, their systems would offer me an interest-free loan on their iPhone. So they've turned this into an app called the Bajaj123 app. So, so say, Bryce, if you come to India again, if you open the app, say, on Saturday morning at 11.30, the app will know exactly what you want to see on Saturday morning at 11.30. They will have studied your behavior. And see, Saturday morning, 11.30, they'll sh show you a cruiser bike. 
their app their technology would have told them that roughly 1 million of our 140 million users will want a cruiser bike they would have gone to the cruiser bike company negotiated a bulk purchase rate and given at price the best possible price on the cruiser bike available in the indian market with 0% financing right and this combination of basically bringing in amazon type construct but also a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, a big data construct that say a uh, google might have it bringing google's analytical strength with amazon's retail capabilities all into one app i think is going to be very very powerful in this country remember we we, we just discussed how tech savvy india has become wow that's off to pay on another level uh, yeah i mean that yeah that's that's pretty incredible like you you often think about uh companies uh you know like the the chinese tech story was a lot of uh chinese tech companies just mirroring what american tech companies had already done but what you've just explained there is not something that i'd ever really heard of before yeah is yeah. this tech something that they're like are, are other nationals looking at this i think the, uh, we're hearing that other countries want to implement upi i think upi is is a, is a game changer it's amazing now the reason upi is hard for other countries to implement is uh, explained right you have to operate on a sort of national scale to get every single citizen mm. to have a unique id then map that unique id to their bank accounts and then map the bank account onto the phone right it's a triangulation of three yeah. very critical things other countries want to do it but uh, it's taken india 10 years and you can imagine right there is a pretty punchy discourse here around civil liberties uh, information sharing and so on and so forth um um so when i you know over the weekend perhaps over a couple of glasses of something nice to drink i sometimes worry about these points but hey monday to friday when i'm investing i and my colleagues and i try to figure out how to make more money from this construct which is quite you know remarkable yeah yeah i i guess the other thing is um the just the the sheer logistics of having a population of 1.5 billion all with phones and all with internet access would be uh like just a massive undertaking and um yeah like i i'm just trying to even just get my head around that like that that would have taken years i imagine and um so so pretty, i think like, uh, heavily- we're not done yet so only 50% of the indian population has smartphones right um so uh, one of the, our largest telecom company is going to roll out in the next couple of months a 10 dollar smartphone a 10 dollar smartphone which means the number of smartphone users is going to double in the next next 12 months yeah. um uh, and amazing. and already even with just 50% of the population having smartphones we use more mobile data than any other continent in the world so when this 10 dollar smartphone hits the market in a couple of months uh, uh we'll sort of have a smart data implode explosion and i think that'll further further increase the reach of companies like bajaj finance right because the the more data footprints more indians generate the more that data can be used to to lend to them to offer them services. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, um we have unfortunately reached the end of our interview Sora, but um thank you so much. It's been absolutely I fascinating and um I'm already looking forward to um having you on again because there's a lot to unpack when it comes to India and every time we do speak to experts, you know, we um I guess we improve our understanding but are also introduced to many opportunities that we just don't come across in our um in our regular sort of reading of of investing material. So thank you so much for your time. Before we do go though, um every year we hold the Equity Mates uh awards and one of the awards is the expert of the year and it's a chance for our community to to just uh vote on who they feel is one expert that has come on the show and has really contributed to uh to their investing journey and by nature of being on this episode you are automatically entered into the oh, award <laughs> um to to just uh, i guess help them um and to leave them with uh with something what is a piece of investing advice or a content recommendation or just a final thought that you would like to pass on to our audience who are you know really curious and and um on the journey of learning to become better investors I mean uh we've tried to make everything that we write basically free or super low cost so marcelus.in our website uh we give all our newsletters all our uh, webinars away for free and and uh, we put stuff every weekend up there so if you want to stay in touch about india just go to marcelus.in and all the newsletters blogs uh, are for free leaving marcelus aside 
leaving Marcellus aside, um, the, the most useful uh, uh, portal for gathering information on the Indian stock market I've found is a site called Money Control. Uh, Money Control is part of a large industrial conglomerate in India, but it's a genuinely useful site. They've got up-to-date news on, on corporate results, share stock prices, uh, tickers, and so on. And if you want to do your own screening on Indian stocks, a free screening service is offered by screener.com screener.in. It's a company it's called Screener. So you can put up any number of Indian companies, screen on fundamentals, screen on valuation. So um, uh, because of the tech savvy nature of Indian society, there's plenty of digital resources available at zero cost. Uh, make the most of it and make the most of what I think would be the defining opportunity in investing for the next decade or so. Wow, that's the quote of the episode. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Finding opportunity of investing for the next decade. Love that. Well, we will make sure we include um, some links to all of those resources in our show notes. But uh, Saurabh, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. We thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, guys.